That's Luke chapter 19. And a title of our message tonight is uh, Jesus Wept. Now in verse 41 in chapter 19 of Luke, it says, And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hast known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the days shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, encompass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. In other words, what Jesus is saying, you just didn't know who was here, did you? You just didn't know who came. You just didn't know who talked to you, did you? You just didn't know. And for this reason, Jesus weeps. Over in Matthew chapter number 23... Verse number 27. Now I can just imagine the cry and the agony of when he said this as he looked down on the city of Jerusalem. He said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chicks under her wings, and ye would not. You just didn't know, did you? You just didn't know who it was that was talking to you. You just didn't know. What a tragedy. Somebody said even on the cross that Jesus died of a broken heart. Even I know all the physical pain and everything, but it says his bowels burst asunder. Jesus in the Bible, actually the shortest verse in the Bible, is in John chapter 11, verse 35. It's kind of amazing, isn't it? Shortest verse in the Bible, two words. It reads this, Jesus wept. Jesus was a weeping preacher. Now, before you get sitting there and say, oh, I just don't believe a man ought to cry, you better understand what weeping is. I ain't talking about some emotional misfit that's sitting there can turn it on and off like a water faucet or somebody that's uh, play acting, you know what I'm saying? And somebody said, well, you know, a man ain't supposed to cry. You've been reading some wrong literature there. Jesus is every bit of a man. But his weeping needs to be examined for what it was. I heard a story about a preacher who told of an experience that he had. He said when he got up to preach, he did fine until he got to the end of the message. And then he would break down and weep. And he would weep during the invitation as he pled with people to move. And he said he could not refrain himself from the tears. But he told me that he had the power of God on his life and the people were converted under his preaching and the church actually grew. But then he said he got embarrassed about his tears one time. Got embarrassed. I suppose a few people snickered and some laughed and, you know, some would say, well, this probably is a put-on. But it bothered him so much that he went down in the woods one day and he got down on his knees by an old stump. And he prayed and asked God to take away his tears so he wouldn't be in embarrassment anymore when he preached in the pulpit. You know what? God answered his prayer. Yeah. Yeah. He took away his tears. 
He said that he was able then to deliver his message without weeping. However, something happened to his ministry though. People were not moved like they were before. His church attendance began to decline. The offerings dropped off and members began losing interest. Now after months of spiritual drought in his ministry and the church dying by degrees, he knew something had to be done. You know what? He went back down into the woods to the very spot where he had knelt down before and asked God to remove his tears then this time he asked God to restore his tears. Well, God answered that prayer too. His tears were restored. The church grew again. Souls were saved. And some of his folks made remarks about how God was blessing in the ministry. And they asked him if he knew what the secret was. And he said, yeah. He said, I've been back down to the stump. Some of us need to get to the stump, huh? Some of us need to get to the stump because we've grown cold, calloused, hard-hearted when it comes to the things of God. Indifferent, cold, calculated. You got to be careful about this. It's a disease. It's a cancer that can strike a Christian and ruin your testimony. Ruin what you're doing for God. Amen. Some of you better get back to the stump. Jesus wept on a number of occasions, but in this message, let us see how he wept over sinners. This wasn't no Tammy Faye Faker kind of weeping now. You remember her? Tammy Faye Baker, excuse me. Yeah, she could turn it on and off like waterworks, man. I mean, all she had to do was just get on. That mascara started running the tears of roll, and it'd get too, it'd get too deep for me. Now, some of that is emotion. Some of it is real. Amen. I guarantee you when Jesus wept, it was real. Amen. It is one thing to be destitute physically, but quite another to be destitute spiritually speaking. I pray God would kill me if I get to that place in my life. And I tell you what, not to say I hadn't got backslidden from time to time. I'm going to tell you something. You look out here in the world, you all upset with the way everybody does. They ain't the problem. We are the problem. The world is dead. They don't know nothing about God. They know nothing about except what you show them and what I show them. Amen. They get back to the stump, huh? Well, one may have everything in the heart, may have everything the heart could actually desire. I mean, you know, speaking of physical things or objects or whatever, and yet you might, you might be just spiritually a pauper. Amen. Have you ever thought about, have you ever really just sit down and thought about this about people? I mean, have you ever really just sit down and thought about what the unsaved person does not have? compared to you. Now basically I know I'm talking to saved people. I mean there may be a few in here that's not saved. But have you ever really sit down and thought about what an unsaved person, where they're headed, what they got to look forward to, and some of the things that they don't have? Now I'm, I'm not talking about their physical things. I'm big cars, clothes, money. I, no, I ain't talking about that. The first thing they don't have, they don't have eternal life. Have you been taking that for granted? I mean, it's the greatest gift you could ever imagine. I mean, where are you going to get eternal life? Hmm? They don't sell this now. And if they did, you wouldn't have enough money to get it. Somebody would outbid you, amen. John 3.36 says, He that believeth upon the Son hath what? Everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. I got a letter in the mail here. Last week I get letters occasionally. <laughs> but anyways, this was a 
a lady had got a hold of a God's plan for man. She lived in Augusta, Georgia. I didn't even recognize the name, didn't know her from Adam's house cat, man. I don't know who she is. And she wrote back. I may have mentioned it here. She was so discouraged. She said she had been clean from drug drugs for about 22 months. Used to be a crack addict. She also was a registered, registered practical nurse. That was her vocation before she got into trouble. She got a couple felonies and make a long story short, she went to jail. You break the law, you go to jail. Amen? Well, the problem with that is, and, and uh, I didn't know it at the time, but she apparently had been one of the few females that ever went to the transitional center down here. And uh, anyway, she went back and went home to try to put her life together, and when it come time to apply for a job, you know what? They looked on that record down there, and you know what they found out? They got felonies here. I don't think we'd be able to hire her. So she got discouraged. She said she's a born-again Christian. She had trusted the Lord for her salvation. She had read that God's plan for men through a couple different times. And she said, I didn't see anything in here about us folks that have messed up in the past. And <laughs> I knew where she's coming from. She didn't find that in there. She said, where is this God that said he's going to provide me my needs? It's a little bitter. I mean, really d discouraged. She's reaching out, crying out to somebody. Even her own church couldn't give her the answers. So she wrote a letter to the guy that wrote that book, God's Plan for Man. I told him, well, I said, We're gonna have to, I'm going to have to answer this letter. I'm going to have to tell this. So uh, we happen to have a toll-free number, which is a number that you can use occasionally. I told her to call us. We got her on the phone last night. And we talked to her find out the situation. She had come down here and she had uh, been in the transitional center and you know if it was at the Salvation Army or someplace over here uh, she had uh, ran into somebody that had had the book and, and, and they gave the book to her you know and uh, so you know never know where these books are going to end up you know it wasn't one I remember giving out you know but anyways um, she said that this past week, she said she had talked to everybody. She said she just had, and you can tell when you get discouraged, you know what I mean? And even though, and I told her, I said, listen, maybe God doesn't want you to continue in that. I don't know, but I know one thing, God's going to take care of your needs. Amen? Now, so you never know where this, you know, we put these books together and we pass out Bible tracts. Um, she said, I told her to call us back. And by the way, somebody called her this week and offered her a two-week thing in the position that she originally had. So I see God's opened the door already. She was excited about that, you know. Her name is Phyllis. Think about it, you pray for her. She's got children and she has grandchildren, all right? Now, you ever sit and thought about what somebody doesn't have or didn't save? They don't have no forgiveness. I'm talking about stuff we take for granted. You know, I know my sins have been forgiven. You're saved, your sins have been forgiven. But somebody lost, they ain't been forgiven for nothing. You ever thought about that? Doesn't bother you to know that people are headed to hell? I mean, to a real, literal hell? And all because maybe you won't even go out of your way to get the gospel to them? Oh, you're so busy, you're so burdened, you're so cumbered with what you're doing, you're not thinking about the things that we need to be thinking about. Amen? We need to get a new vision on what we're doing here. We've lost track of what's going on. We're bogged down in the circumstances that surround us. We get so bogged down, see, we get, we want to have a pity party. You know what that is, don't you? Woe is me, man. I, I find myself having one daily sometimes, you know. Woe is me. I've seen more of this going on this past year. I'm talking about with God's people. I ain't talking about the lost, man. I'm talking about us that are saved. Amen. We all should be going around, nobody knows the trouble I... <laughs> Amen. I mean, because that's all you hear coming out of our mouths sometimes. We ought to be ashamed of ourselves. 
We got the greatest thing going for us in the world, and boy, we don't even act like it half the time. I don't know how anybody gets saved. I mean, I know how they get saved. God does the saving because it certainly ain't us. <laughs> Amen. I mean, if you, uh, what shining examples we are sometimes. I said we. <laughs> I think all of us need to head to the stump. They don't have forgiveness. He says all the sins he or she ever committed are still unforgiven. To the unsaved, he says in John 9, 41, your sin remaineth because ye have refused. I've called. Amen? Their sins remain. Now, a famous evangelist tells the story of a lady who came to him after the service one night. She told him that she had been a terrible sinner. Then she asked him if she would have to face all her sins at the judgment. Well, he assured her that she would if she did not get forgiveness for those sins. Then he told her how to become a Christian when he told her that all her sins were gone now and would never be brought up against her, she shouted for joy, walked out of the room with a smile on her face, waving her hand and saying, I am free! Thank God I am free! Now sometimes we better get, it, we better get an idea of what freedom is. Freedom ain't doing what you want to do when you want to do it. Freedom is being forgiven of your sins where you have a home in heaven. You only do that one way, repent and get saved. Some of the things that a lost person don't have. They don't have no peace. I don't care how you cut it. They don't. You didn't have any before you got saved. Neither did I. There was no peace in my life. It was turmoil. One thing after another. Amen. Oh, there was temporary fixes. Dope and everything included now, you know. You know what a temporary fix is, don't you? <laughs> the word temporary, it doesn't last long, does it? The high gets low. <laughs> but there's no real peace. And then you say, well, Brother Larry, if I just had me some, uh, some more money, I'd be real happy. I see some of the most miserable people in this world are rich people. I'm serious, man. They're miserable. You know what else he doesn't have? He doesn't have fellowship with God. Now, granted, you and I are saved. We're supposed to be having fellowship with God, and sometimes we're out the back door on that. Let me ask you a question. How long do you spend praying to God a day? Don't answer me. <laughs> Don't answer me. I don't want no raise of hands and tell me how long. But I mean, just seriously, how long do you, do you spend actually talking to God? How long do you spend in this book? Hmm? Well, there's two, two means of communication. Amen. This is God speaking to me, and prayer is me speaking to God. Don't you think He wants to hear from us? You know, one of the tragedies is that, well, Brother Larry, I'm so busy. <laughs> yeah, I understand your busyness. I'm busy too. I'm busy sometimes when I'm sleeping. I got things going on all the time. Yeah, I'm too busy. And I can see it sometimes too. I'll tell you what, you get too busy to talk to God and get with God, you're way too busy. You better reorganize your time. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Some of us are not disciplined when it comes to how we do what we do. You've got to listen, get to the point in your life when if you've got something to do, you organize it and you stick with it. Amen. Amen. Or you'll be disorganized. Now, if you don't think God's an organized God, you don't know nothing about God. Just take a look around you how organized this universe is. Somebody made the comment one day that God doesn't care about me just being lacking. Oh, get off that mess. God is a God of order. You don't follow a schedule. You don't discipline yourself. You're going to be in trouble. Amen. Do you know that 
they don't have the privilege to pray. Now, you know, lost people will tell you they pray. Sure, they tell you. I've had them tell me, I don't care how they pray. Ain't, they ain't getting through to the God that I'm in touch with. You don't get in touch with God until you get in his family. Oh, I'm not saying that God doesn't hear what you're murmuring. Amen. But he will not hear and answer your prayers till you repent and trust him. He don't answer the, devil, the devil's children's prayers. And that's who we are before we're saved. Amen. Who's our father then? Satan. Amen. Now, granted, I understand how you got to that conclusion, some of you. You know why? Because God didn't allow anything bad enough to kill you yet. Now, I look back on my life. You know, I look at some of the things, the scrapes I got out. I said, man, God must have been watching over me. <laughs> I don't know if he was watching over me or he just... See, God knew where I was going to be down the road. I didn't, but he did. He may have spared my life because he knew that I was going to trust him one day. Had he not, I'd probably been cut loose long ago. Now, God ain't going to be mocked. He ain't going to put up with that nonsense long from people. Amen. Amen. I mean, there's a limit with God's patience. I know he's a long-suffering God, but there is a limit with God's patience. No wonder, then, that his great heart was moved with compassion. And in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 36, and, this, and now listen to what he said. But when he saw the multitudes... He was moved with compassion on him. We see the multitudes around here. We get moved with not compassion. <laughs> we get moved with, oh man, what do we got to do now? What's next? You follow what I'm saying? I hear the word, I get the word, what is it? We like to call it burnout. You ever heard the word burnout? You know there is a recipe from keeping you from getting burnt out. Right in here. And it, I'm going to tell you what, it's, it's, it's a known fact. You can get burnt out. There's no doubt about it. People get burnt out all the time. There is a way you can prevent that. But it goes back again to your relationship directly with God. Amen. I'll tell you, when, when, when the heat gets on and the pressure gets strong, instead of running from God, you need to run to God. Go back to the stump. Amen. I think all of us need to take a little trip down in the woods or go down into the pea patch and get on the ground. Get real. We, we're the ones that's got, listen, we're the ones that has the message. We're the only one that's going to save this world. Reach it for Christ. What do you expect, the dead man to do it? What's God's people doing? Complaining, complaining, complaining. Complaining, complaining. I'm going to tell you something, and it affects one another too. All you got to do is get up and come into a situation in one room. You just take one person that's crybagging, complaining, and it's like a cancer starts spreading through the room. Amen? I, I told my wife, I said, get on me if I get up and start making excuses and, and start whining around how much I got on me. Tell me about it. I get tired of hearing it. I mean, good night, my day's ruined sometimes before it gets started here and that kind of stuff. What I got to look forward to, amen? Have to come preach. You're supposed to lift up other people and somebody beating you down. Do you get the message? It ain't easy. You know what you got to do? You got to get in touch with him. You get back to the stump. You know, he wept over their destination, by the way. Now, he knew where they were going. Jesus taught about hell. People don't want to talk about hell today. Who, who do you, how many people are sitting around down at the picnic table talking about going to hell? Or anybody that's going to hell? You don't discuss that usually. It ought to be discussed. There's so many people going and it's real and it can happen today. Ain't, ain't too many people even talking about going to heaven. Makes you wonder if anybody's even gone. Huh? Well, I mean, seriously. I mean, I know I'm going because it ain't up to me. It's up to him. <laughs> I don't deserve it. That's what salvation is all about. God did for me what I can't do for myself. But he expects something in return. Not for the salvation, but for the fact that I am a child of God. 
By the way, he taught that we need to repent. Some of us don't even know what repentance is. Jesus said, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all what? Perish. No repentance, no salvation. I don't care what the preacher said. I don't care what anybody said. If you don't repent, you'll never get saved. Repentance means you've got to come to the end of yourself, have a change of mind, realize you're headed to hell. You don't know you're headed to hell. You ain't going to get saved until you do know. In other words, you've got to get lost before you can get saved. Amen. People, and then listen, you say, well, Brother Larry, you, mean to, you want me to go tell somebody that? No, I just want you to go share the, God's plan of salvation, but I want you to make it clear to them. Oh, I can get anybody to pray a little prayer. You know, that's easy to do. I can sit somebody down and, you know, hey, I'm taking through this and, you know, wonderful. <laughs> Would you mind praying? You want to ask God to save? Oh, sure, whatever. I don't even know what they're doing. If you don't know why you're asking God to save you, you won't get saved. The reason you have to ask God to save you is you can't save yourself. You're hopelessly lost without Christ. Somebody's got to lead you to the Lord. Amen. You know what that somebody is? You. Yeah. Oh, you said, well, that's your, that's your job, Brother Larry. Where'd you read that? Amen. Sure, it's my job. But it's also a job of every other Christian. This ain't a, hey, this ain't a talent. I'm talking about leading somebody to the Lord. It's a commandment from God. Amen. We better keep this, we better keep it in perspective. Amen. When he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they had fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. <laughs> hell is real, it's eternal. Folks, when somebody dies and they're not saved, they go straight to hell. I don't care what anybody tells you, what anybody reads, or what anybody ever wrote, the Bible says they go straight to hell. Amen. How about it? He wept not only over their destination, but then he wept over their denunciation. This is the sad part. When he saw the people's total rejection of him, his heart went out from him. That's where that verse came in. He says, like he's crying. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He said, you know, you, you're the one that killed the prophets. He said, I sent prophets to you, and you killed them in your religious zeal. And by the way, that's what it was. Did you know that? They were, they were killed by the religious leaders. He said, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent on the day. And they stoned Stephen to death. Deacon full of the Holy Ghost telling them, <laughs> I mean, read, I'm telling you, and they... they they got so convicted, they gnashed on them with their teeth like a bunch of dogs. People have a hard time with the truth sometimes. Amen. How often would I have gathered thy children together even as a hen gathereth her chicks under her wings? And you know, he said, you wouldn't do it. You wouldn't do it. You know, there's a world out there today that needs to see Christ in us. Amen. How would you, let me ask you a question. Would you expect, if you saw a Christian, don't you expect a Christian to live a, a more moral life than a lost person? Huh? Wouldn't you expect that? Wouldn't you expect a Christian to tell the truth to you? Wouldn't you expect a Christian to do right? Not that we're perfect, but to basically do right. Amen? I mean, why would you want to become a Christian? You know what the problem with us is today? The world takes a look at us. They don't see any difference in them. To us. They say, that's a Christian. You know, Mahatma Gandhi made the statement one time. He said, I would be a Christian if I could see one. In other words, what he was saying was, he, he said, I ain't seen nobody that acted any better than I. I mean, he said, you know, I'm a good moral man. I try to do the best I can for people. I'm a peacemaker. But what he was saying, in essence, was, if you could show me a Christian, I'll be one. But nobody could show him anybody that had a more moral life than him. Not that morality will save you. Never has anyway. But I see, you, I see his point. What are we showing the world today? What are we showing the world? How are you reacting when somebody comes and asks of your time? What kind of attitude do you have? What, what do you tell them? 
They're coming for help. What do we do? Huh? Maybe we ought to go to the stump, huh? Now, I'm speaking for myself. See, I need this as much as anybody in here. Now, I figure, well, I'll just unload the package then. So I need to hear it just as much as you need to hear it. Because, see, I get cold. I, you can go, hey, I got this place to go to, I got this place to go to, I got to preach here, I got to preach there, I got to preach. I can get old hat real quick. Oh, I know the gospel upside down. I can walk in preach. Hallelujah, man. That ain't the answer. You don't do it with God's power, you're spinning your wheels and you're wasting your time. If you don't do it for the right reason, you shouldn't do it at all. Amen. Amen. If you're not motivated by the reason that God said we need to be motivated for, then we got a problem. What you do is do this. You take yourself. You see where you're at. See where you came from. Another individual comes to you instead of it being a taxing burden to speak to them or to deal with them. You better remember what you're dealing with. You're dealing with somebody that needs help. Now granted, I know sometimes we have to deal with one that. And you said, oh, Brother Larry, I don't know what we're going to do. We're going to let this guy back in. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. Why don't you get in the corner and ask God what to do? Amen. Did you get saved the first time you heard the gospel? I didn't. I wanted to throw the brick through the television a couple times. I didn't like Jerry Falwell, one of them. Talking about my long hair, I didn't like him at all. I wanted to bust the TV up, man. Get off my case. You understand? I, I mean, he was preaching the gospel probably. I mean, you know, I didn't like his attitude. Of course, I didn't have a very good attitude myself. Hello. What we deal with that comes comes our way here. Oh, and it, hey, <laughs> I understand what you're talking about. Sometimes you can't even hardly get a breath in. I'm going to tell you one thing, though. Let me tell you this, and you'll remember this when you get to the judgment seat of Christ. You'll probably weep yourself. You may not shed no tears here. There will be a day when God will have to wipe the tears out of your face and my face because of our lack of weeping. Amen. And it's not, you know, where they say, it's not a man doesn't cry. I'll tell you what, if you can't weep, there's something wrong with you. Maybe you ought to get to the stump and ask God to give you some tears. I'm not talking about this Mickey Mouse stuff. I'm talking about real weeping for the right reason. If it doesn't bother you that people are going to hell, then you need to be down at the stump. Amen? But one day, you and I is going to have to stand before a holy God at the judgment seat of Christ, and I guarantee you, you hadn't done nothing that you ain't going to be glad you have done for God, and you haven't done a whole lot of things you wish you had done. Amen? All of us. Because some of our works are going to burn up right in front of our face. They were done for the wrong reason. Amen? Shall we bow our heads? Hi, if you're sitting there tonight and you say, Preacher, I'm not 100% sure I'm going to heaven, I'd like to invite you to bow your head now and I'll lead you in a prayer where you can trust Jesus as your personal Savior. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. I believe.